You know what you're about to listen to? The Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Traveling is a massive part of my work. While I absolutely love it, what really amazes me time and time again is the people I get to meet in cities around the world. Whether I'm traveling as an urban design consultant, doing a keynote, or filming my TV series about urbanism, the life-size city, I have the privilege of meeting passionate people working to make their cities better in so many different ways. I learn so much. Now, I'm of the opinion that most cities are basically broken in various ways and on many scales. Luckily, we're working hard to fix here in the age of urbanism that shines brighter each and every day. Some of the cities I've worked in recently are considerably more broken than others and have gone through severe phases of urban transformation. In this episode of The Word on the Street, I'll explore how these cities are trying to reboot themselves and rise again. The narrative of revival is strong. The underdog who makes a comeback is universally cherished as a storyline. But where there is hype, there is also reality. I am Aaron Foley. I am the chief storyteller at the City of Detroit government. I met Aaron in Turin, where we were both speaking at Torino Stratisferica, quite literally one of the coolest events I've ever been invited to speak at. Talking about Detroit while in an Italian city is a bit ironic, but I've worked with the city of Detroit, and I filmed an episode of my TV series there. I have Detroit on my brain. It is absolutely fascinating to me. Who better to talk to than Aaron? I interviewed him on the fly as we walked through the streets to a cafe. Aaron is a strong character and pensive. He looks away into the distance when he answers, like he's perusing his vast library of knowledge and experience. He also walks really fast. What do you do as chief storyteller? As chief storyteller, I manage a team of creatives. So I've got two videographers, two writers, and a photographer. And we're part of a larger uh, media services department for the city. And we go out and document Detroit. So our videographers make some short films for our cable channel and online. Our writers go and interview people. I go interview people. And our photographer makes it all look really nice. And why? Uh, what's the point of, uh, of documenting the storytelling of Detroit? Um, what's the vision of it? <laughs> the vision is to really show what Detroit is made of and have some, you know, born and raised Detroiters talk about their own city. Um, You know, storytelling about the city, even though we're doing it from the government's perspective, right, it's still talking to people about their own city, you know, having, you know, putting the voice back into their hands, I guess. Um, There's been a lot of media about Detroit, both inside Detroit and outside Detroit, and it misses a lot of the human aspect and this is a lot of the community aspect so we go into the neighborhoods and we just talk to people in the neighborhoods about like why did you open a business in this neighborhood why did you move to this neighborhood why did you buy a house here um it's just you know it's kind of it's there used to be like community sections in newspapers but then newspapers started to lose those and so now newspapers only come to certain neighborhoods when there's crime or poverty or something like that not to say it doesn't happen it does uh, big issue in Detroit obviously But, you know, people are just like, well, what about my block club? What about my church? What about this? What about that? That's what we try to put a spotlight on. Does Detroit need a chief storyteller and a media team more than other cities uh, to to tell the story of the city? I think so. Um, I think Detroit's image has been battered. You're walking fast, dude. Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let's slow down. Um, I think, you know, Detroit's image has been battered so much, especially in the international stage and the national stage. You know, a lot of people are just annoyed with, like, this idea that, uh, you know, Detroiters just eat raccoons and hang out in abandoned buildings, right? There certainly are a lot of challenges in Detroit, but um, we're not ignorant of that. You know, we we show abandoned houses in our videos and stuff like that. But I think they need us because somebody's got to talk about, like, you know, millennials who aren't necessarily moving downtown and drinking expensive coffee. You know, what about the millennials that, like, were born and raised here? Mm -hmm. Um, somebody's got to talk about like women that own businesses, black women that own businesses. There can always be more media, right? We already had this media department. Now we're just adding online stuff to it. Now we're adding podcasting to it. Now we're adding all these things that the city has never done. Let's just try it. Let's try new ways of 
connecting with res- residents, communicating with residents, and telling the world what our story is. As you say, Detroit maybe needs this more than other cities, but do you think this is a concept uh, that, that is transferable to other, other cities? Having a chief storyteller, somebody to, to curate uh, uh, you know, the news flow and, and, this, and this, the, the narrative of the city uh, in order to preserve it uh, for future generations in this crazy media world where you know, we lose track of everything? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, I mean, that's a really good point that I always forget about is, like, we're, we are documenting things for history. You know, I don't call myself a journalist. You know, it's kind of insulting to all the journalists that practice in newspapers and whatnot. And they flip out if, like, you know, like a government journalist or whatever the term is. Um, so I don't use that term. But, yeah, we're, we're doing that. You know, we're preserving history. We're creating an archive, you know, a video archive, a written archive, a digital archive. And that needs, you know, we always need more of that. You can never have enough history, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be transferred to other cities that especially want to... Especially want to have extra media, right? You know, we're not trying to replace or, or, or supplant, you know, traditional media. But at the same time, you still want, like, an archive beyond, like, your city council meetings and uh, fucking water board meetings and all, all, all these other, like, boring meetings that, that where all the nuts and bolts stuff happen. But this is kind of like the fun side of, of what's happening in Detroit. Now, we, we've lived in cities for 7,000 years. We have some record of what happened before. We have some buildings around, uh, you know, archaeology and whatnot. Uh, but with the transient nature of modern media, the digital age, you know, stuff can get lost real quick, right? Um, so you think it's, you're also having an, a, you're performing an important function uh, in, in recording and, and documenting where we don't have newspapers anymore. We're not going to, you know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. no physical proof of that we were here. I, you know, I, now that I think about it... <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we're kind of like, I guess, junior historians in that way. Like, we, we, we are creating this. You know, we, and somebody's got to. You know, there's, there's been too many times where, now, you know, I'm thinking deeper about this. There's been too many times where the accomplishments of people of color in, in, the, in the city of Detroit, we're full of them, right? There used to be newspapers that celebrated this type of thing. You know, like, uh, back in the 50s, like, I've got all these news clips because my great aunt used to be a fashion designer. And not like a world renowned, like here in Italy, fashion designer, but just someone who made a lot of clothes for like people in town. And nowadays, like nobody would cover that, right? So you've got, we've got a chance here to really document what people are doing in Detroit right now, especially at this weird stage of transition where we're transitioning from like the 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 poster child for decline, and now we're the poster child for recovery, right? Um, we can't forget, you know, that it's more than just the billionaires who are doing stuff, and it's more than just, uh, you know, the leaders and stuff like that. It's all these people putting it together, and we're documenting it. You know, we're, we're, trying, to save, we're trying to save some kind of record of, of it, and that's important so that people down the line, like, I mean, too many times in Detroit history, think about that, too. So much stuff has been mistranslated over the years, like, you know, Coleman Young saying, old mayor back in the day, way back in the day, saying, you know, hit a, hit a mile, right? And that quote just got twisted around so many times by by, by people that now we just, now there's this ongoing debate about it that shouldn't even be. Um, what if we just had the chance now to like okay like show that like okay yeah people do care about their neighborhoods. People are interested in Detroit. People do give a shit about Detroit. Um, here's the evidence of all of that. Well, we're just getting interrupted because we have to order. Coffee, yeah. coffee, coffee latte. Coffee latte. latte. Coffee latte. Yeah. Cafe, due coffee latte. Due coffee. What, what I don't know what I'm hearing this and it's awesome. I'm thinking like you know. Uh, we were talking earlier about, you know, like, oh, Detroit's narrative is we are building the shiny towers and yeah. coming, you know, you can see them from afar and yeah, see, yeah, oh, yeah. Man, it's revival. We got millions of dollars in the downtown. But in a way, you're, you're documenting the people like you, your yeah. aunt, right? Like, you know, yeah. she just did an awesome job designing clothes that people bought. I mean, yeah. that's the, the, the neighborhood stories yeah. for me in Detroit is like, you know, that's those people who are still there and yeah. say, yeah, I'm sticking it out, man. I mean, that, the, the, is that a part of it? The human uh, storytelling, not just the big grand narrative of Detroit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the... From the city government perspective, obviously we can't be like, oh, you know, no, no billionaires, no, 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 no new shiny things, right? You know, it's it, downtown recovery is part of the city recovery as a whole, but it's our opportunity as what I do in my department is to tell our team, like, okay, we know that every news outlet in town is going to cover that. There will be a record of what Dan Gilbert is doing. There will be a record of, you know, this this million-dollar grant here and this million-dollar grant there. Go out into the neighborhoods where, you know, that's not getting as much coverage. 
Go out and talk to those people. Go out and cover those businesses so that we can make sure that they are being elevated to the same platform and their voices are being amplified to the same level as the people who are automatically going to get all that good PR. Cool. After Turin, I found myself back in Medellin, in Colombia. One of the fairy tale cities in our global urban narrative, thanks to the massive transformation from murder capital of the world to world leader in inclusion and urban innovation. Now, I can't go to Medellin without meeting with Carlos Cadena Gaitan, researcher on urban sustainability and university professor. Carlos also co founded Ciudad Verde, Green City, a not for profit organization applying tactical urbanism strategies. Carlos is a powerhouse as a thinker, and as a doer, and a great personal inspiration to me. We arranged a public screening of the Medellin episode of The Life-Size City, and afterwards we found some time for a quick guerrilla interview on the street. Okay, Carlos, so the story of Medellin, the amazing urban transformation, the story that has been told all over the world, what is happening now? Where does Medellin need to go now? Is is the story over, or is it... Uh, continuing, uh, what do you think about the future? No, the, the story is not over. I think we've reached a point where we sort of paused our fantastic transformation of the last decade and where we are sort of reorganizing as, as a society as to where we want to go and how we're going to get there. Uh, I think a lot of this our recent success in the last decade has to do with the people. It definitely has to do with the processes led by the people, by communities, by interactions between communities and the state and the, and the private sector and the academic sector. And what we've seen lately is, unfortunately, a disconnection between these sectors. It's sort of around the idea that... that um, uh, some of the groups have been co-opted. Uh, advertising and social media have sort of disrupted the amazing process that we had had. So we are uh, reorganizing that it hasn't stopped and it won't stop. I think um, it's up to us. It's up to the citizens of Medellin to continue pushing for a life-size city. So you're, you're optimistic about the continuation of this amazing urban transformation. I, I mean, tonight we had a screening of the Life Size City episode of Medellin, and, and we were talking afterwards, and it's like, yeah, like the stuff that happened here is epic. It's legend, you know, and, and I just, I, me, the guy who doesn't even live here, I want that to continue. I want you to be like even more legend. It's like winning the World Cup, and then you know you're like Germany. You you bomb out in the in the group stage. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, is it enough to do incremental continuation, or what does it take to to go to the next level? Yeah, I I don't think we can indulge on uh, going back. I mean, this city has had the amazing possibility of becoming a global innovator on its own right. It was not a marketing invention uh, during the last decade. It was a serious, well-planned, well-designed uh, inclusion, exclusion, equity, equality-led um, process. And we know how to do it, Michael. That's, that's probably one of the things that we should remember we know how to do it there's amazing people here that know how to transform previously dangerous neighborhoods into amazing human settlements there's people here who know how to make sure that they are large massive public transport projects that are so hard to manage in the global south actually become a reality there's people here that have uh, focused on uh, the challenge of informality, uh, the next challenge of our urbanization phase in our world, and have proposed and transformed solutions that are studied all over the world. Unfortunately, I do think the political question continues to be the question all over the world. In Colombia, is 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 not the exception. 
if you ask me, I think we need to make sure that we vote for the right groups every time. If you ask me, I think we need to make sure that we follow up on what they promise. And um, as I have led with my friends, we need to continue pressuring our politicians to make sure that they do give us what we deserve as a global capital. I, I think we can still do it. We know how to do it. I was talking to the guy tonight at this amazing space here in, in Medellin. And he says, oh, I'm in charge of like the Metro Cable and we want to put an, uh, a new one in, in Poblado, the, 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 the posh neighborhood. Uh, we don't want to just only have Metro Cable for poor neighborhoods. What do you think about that? He says to me, and I'm going, dude, you made Metro Cable. Like, you made it transport for the first time ever. Uh, you know how to do that. So, of course, you continue. You don't put some new inventions in, like a funicular. It's a good return on investment if you continue with a system that you know how to run. If you implement a Metro Cable in Poblado, you know how to work it. Like it works with the rest of the system. So I'm saying continue with the same crazy innovation that you did, but I'm still looking for, I still, I, dude, I want Medellin, man. I want you to go to the next level and then the next level and the next level. So I'm just, I, I need like a podcast hug now, uh, <laughs> a, a confirmation that it's going to happen. Can you give me that? I think the fact that you came again and, and, and you inspired us tonight while we watched the live Size CD for the first time for all of us here in Medellin really gives us a little energy to continue working on our dream. I do want to tell you, Michael, Medellin is, is, is this amazing bipolar city. I mean, we're working on doing the right thing all the time, but huge animal in the room, as you call it, um, the elephant in the room. It's still there, you know, we're still also voting for governments and we're still also promoting and, and supporting projects that intend to build cities for cars, intend to build cities for noise and pollution. That's not the way to go. So I'm going to take this opportunity to promise you that there's lots of citizens in Medellin that are going to continue pushing for the fantastic idea of taking Medellin to the next level. In five years when you come back and visit us with your next screening we probably will have fantastic new and human scale projects in the in the Medellin Life Size City 2.0. If you don't, you're buying the alcohol. <laughs> I'm going to buy it today as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carlos. <laughs> Cheers, mate. One of my goals with this podcast is telling positive stories about all the amazing things happening in this age of urbanism and the potential for many more amazing things. The story of Medellin is positive. But I have to be honest. I know Carlos. He is a passionate, driven human who believes so deeply in urban change and who dedicates his life to the pursuit of it. So it was a bit of a bummer to hear him speaking so tame about the current situation in his city. A completely different Carlos than the last time I met him. What he didn't say was that it is directly political. The current mayor is not the kind of mayor that spun the city around and shoved it in a new, improved direction. He is no Sergio Fajardo. There is no continuation of the drive that put Medellin on the map. I guess this is a lesson that we need to learn. Legendary urban renewal led by epic politicians who stand shoulder to shoulder with the citizens can stagnate, grind to a halt, cast a dark shadow of doubt over basically everything. Carlos, however, won't stop being Carlos. He is just taking a deep breath and hoping for a new election a new direction. He himself sounds like he is rebooting. He'll be back. In the early 1960s, it was proposed that the car-clogged main street through Copenhagen's medieval city center should be pedestrianized. Like most places in the world, there was serious pushback. One slogan used by motorists was, We are not Italians meaning car parking was normal and walking was something the Italians did. The city tested the idea with a pilot project that was a huge success, and it was made permanent. Stroll, which is the name of the street, remains the beating heart of a traffic-calmed city center. Copenhageners realized suddenly that maybe they were Italians after all. Or, rather, just homo sapiens who have an inherent desire for walkable and bikeable cities. Now, it would seem that even Italians 
in a way, are not Italians anymore, what with the car-clogged streets of their cities and suburban wastelands. I met two amazing friends in Turin for a chat at a cafe about the state of things in their cities and in their country. Giacomo Buragi is an expert in urban strategy, and he founded Secolo Urbano, or Urban Century. His calm exterior is betrayed by a brilliant mind and an unending passion to talk about cities. His constant energy is contagious. Luca Ballerini is an architect with Bellissimo, a design bureau he co-founded in 1998. He is the organizer of the Torino Stratisferica Festival of Design and Architecture I spoke at, and he is a great urban thinker. Now, I'm not going to give you Italy invented the life-size city. I'm not going to let you have that one. You guys want to think you <laughs> invented everything in Italy. But, I mean, before Italy even, even existed. Even bikes. Yeah, 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 the Leonardo da Vinci designed the yeah, whatever. Um, so I don't think, of course, Italy had designed the life-size city, but, I mean, I think you really perfected it. You know, through through millennia, you know, just this piazza we're on here and the whole quality of life and the scale of the buildings. I mean, you know, an amazing period of history perfecting the life-size city. Boy, did you ever screw that up, right? How did you screw it up? How did how did why do you suck so bad now in Italian cities? You know, this this piazza is nice, but most of them have it's car parking now. What I think hell? because we got bored. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's it's not easy to to understand that the, maybe the first prototype of city that you kind of had in history was actually the, the best one. So you want to change things, you know. That voice was Luca Ballerini. Soft-spoken, thoughtful, intelligent. You kind of get bored. You want to have new new squares, new new life, new boulevards and all of a sudden, you, you realize that you really screwed up and, and yeah, it, it sucks. And I don't know why, but it's true. Uh, I mean, the outskirts of the city, Italian city today, it's so bad that you don't, you don't really know that you are in a city. You don't know the kind of landscape you're in. You can't recognize it, so... And I have also my own opinion about it. I think that it's... <laughs> no surprise of there. Of course. <laughs> that voice is my man Giacomo Beraggi. Bold, brash, and brilliant. I think that it's uh, basically, uh, and we are at a coffee, so we can have a sort of this coffee chatting, uh, so it's a lack of vision. So I think that uh, back in the Renaissance, back in uh, the Medici, uh, Firenze, they had a vision, man. They had money, they had uh, enormous resources, like in a way we have also today, but we linked those resources with a vision, with a vision that was, in my opinion, really top-down and detached from the contemporary time. So they didn't have the need yeah. to comply with urgent need, with the daily routines. They put their limits, their boundary centuries ahead. Yeah, that's, that's how uh, Firenze, uh, Siena get born. That's how we, I am of this side, of course, invented uh, life-size cities. <laughs> I think historically, that's interesting. I think historically, you know, life went on, new generations were born. There was not a, not, nothing really new in cities. You know, everybody just continued. They created art. They, they you know, created commerce. Uh, but then, come on, the automobile was really the first big, weird, new thing. A game changer. A, a game changer, yeah. I mean, the game loser, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, but I mean, so, I mean in, in a sense, of course, the Italian story is the same as everywhere else in the world. You put cars into your cities. You took away the, the, the canals in Milan. You, uh, you know, the squares. This was parking. I will guarantee you this was parking it just was. 20 it years was. ago. Yeah, or it five. Was. I don't even know. It but, was. Yeah. I mean, so that, that, you know, we had no game changer like that on that scale in our cities. For thousands of years, and that so that was the, the one big thing. So I mean, do you agree? I mean, the the, the car was uh, a big elephant in the room, and it still is. And Italians, oh, we love our cars. Everywhere I go, people say, "Oh, but Michael, we love our cars." I'm going, yeah, everybody fucking loves their cars. Okay, like there's, it's not an Italian thing or an American thing. But how do you reverse that now? Well, I, I remember clearly when we reversed that. I mean, because my uh, grandma was living in the in Piazza Castello, you know, very close to where, where we met yesterday, and. 
when we were visiting her uh, when I was a kid, uh, the cars were going around the castle in the piazza, okay? You, you could actually drive around it. And there was a pump station, an oil station. I mean, it was all based on cars. And I think that, uh, I mean, but life n never really ceased around the city. So I think that Italian cities are still kind of successful in having a life-size city in their own. So, yes, we do have cars and we're now trying to have, you know, to give the city back to citizens, to people who are going by bikes and pedestrians. But um, the cars are, have been a, yeah, a kind of damage, if you want, but not much in, the, in how the life was affected. I think the life was always... I mean, if we can name one thing that Italian cities were always successful at, I think that's the kind of life-size atmosphere that you have. Yeah. Because the squares and the public space that we created back in history, it's still there. Maybe for some years it's been, you know, kind of... Uh, covered by cars everywhere, but it was already, it was still existing. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah, we have to deal with a major question, in my opinion. It's not just about, like Michael uh, taught us yesterday, uh, loving or hating bikes or cars. It's mostly about modernity and freedom. So, why did the car was so successful in Italy? Because to us in the 60s, uh, it was like our link to modernity, maybe and a freedom. fake link, but our link to modernity and freedom. Yeah, and yeah. as you said yesterday, also in Denmark they perceived this, it was perceived as a link to modernity and freedom. So the question to solve this problem today, because car of course is a problem, is getting back to this uh, proper question how to link Italy with its history and so on with modernity and freedom without using an old and foreigner tool as carries mm. so the question is let's put on the table another tool but we have to deal with this need for modernity and freedom that Italian still has mm. I want to point out that at the end of the 17th century, in this town, Torino, it was not at all in the European map. We had a so like today, a, basically. <laughs> exactly. Nobody's heard of. Nobody yeah, knows what Torino yeah, yeah, is. Yeah, but yeah, not yeah. like Milan, eh, Luca. Yeah. Exactly. But back then, you know, because Europe was, was the center of the world, um, the Savoy king of that period had a brilliant, uh, you know, forward-looking idea. And he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do a book about the city that I would like to have, not the city that I have. Okay? The king made a book back then? Yes. Oh, wow. And he printed it in 1682. And he printed it in Amsterdam because that was the best printer of Europe. And it's called Theatrum Sabaudie. And it depicts a world that is not existing, full of castles and places that he was thinking of, you know, he, he was aiming to build. But uh, just 20% of that was built. The rest was just imagination. Back to the vision we need. Okay, so yeah. we, he was able to say, okay, to the other kings of the Europe, you know, to say, this is the town I'm, I'm building, and uh, all of you are invited to come and see. So now today we have this crown of delices, how it's called, mm -hmm. uh, of 20 castles surrounding the city in a crown. You know, it's, a, it's a ring. And that was... Uh, Almost, you know, 90% of that was achieved because all of, you know, the rest of the people followed that vision. But when he printed that book, nothing was existing. Mm. So this is the cool thing about, you know, building a city that is uh, resembling the desire of a, uh, of a, of a life-size city. You know, he wanted to have life in his, in his city. He wanted to attract people from all over Europe. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, now I think, and you're Italian, so you tell me if, uh, if I'm right or wrong. Yeah. Well, we were filming in Milan with this activist group called 12 Square Meters, and they took away a little piazza, the parking, mm -hmm. and we, we made a tactical urbanism pop-up space. And people were, like, driving in there when they were setting up, and they're going, oh, what the fuck, is my parking, oh, no. And then, but old people were walking past going, oh, yeah, I remember when that was a piazza. I remember we used to sit there. You know, ah, cool. Like so, like the old people who are usually the pain in the ass in our societies, the ones who 
vote conservative. They vote for Brexit. You know, the, the, the old people who are going to die soon screw it up for the young people. But here, I think, is that an advantage? Because you, you, it's a recent history, right? You still have old people going... I used to Let's sit there. Remember. I met that beautiful girl on that bench back when I was yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 18, and, and yeah, let's 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 make that a public space again. America is screwed. They don't really have a, uh, the same kind of perception of public space that we do in Europe. The journey is is farther for them. But do you think that in Italy there is a, it, you have a, a shorter route because you have people who can remember what it used to be like just 20 years ago or 40 years ago? Yeah, I kind of agree with this. Uh, so that we could be saved because we have a recent memory of uh, what the past was, what the life-size past was. But still, I get to my point that we have to link this, let's say, uh, romanticism with contemporary time and freedom. So we cannot solve the car problem and get him back just get him we cannot solve the car problem just get him back to our old past we have to mix this so we are lucky that we had this so recently but we have to mix it mix it uh, in a contemporary way uh, i have no solution right in my hands if not i would be a famous TED speaker like michael would soon be but um, in a way um, i think that that's the key Getting back to the old romantic time, it's not enough. Now, in my, in my rhetoric, when I've been, you know, fine-tuning how I talk about bikes, and I'm not a cyclist, so I don't really, you know, but I believe in the bike in the cities. I mean, I started changing my rhetoric, and I used the word modern. And I, in the talk yesterday, I think I said it three times. This yep. is what modern cities are doing. Yeah, I because, noticed that. Uh, but, I mean, you know, because the, the last, what the automobile industry did in the 1920s to change the perception of streets was saying, hey, you know, cars are the future. If you're not on board, you're kind of old-fashioned. And if you live in a city, you want to be like, you know, you want to be down with, uh, Edgy, down huh? with the homies, right? Edgy, I mean, yeah. So do you think, you're, you said it, you said, oh, with freedom and modernity. Um, how do we define this? How do we uh, package it for urban development? Not just like I do with the bikes, but I mean, how can we use this rhetoric To, to make people feel stupid for still wanting car parking or whatever, you know, uh, in order to sell the idea of, uh, of, a, of a better city in the future. Can we package this freedom, uh, this freedom narrative and mo modernity narr narrative? Yeah, let's wait a bit, the uh, big uh, Catholic... Bells, uh, man. Yeah. We stopped this in Copenhagen. Like, people no. complain. Really? We're not religious anymore. So, like, all we have all these churches from back in the day, and, like, people, you know, ding, dong, and people are going, can you stop the damn bells? Can we do it on Sunday or at a funeral? Yeah, okay, you can do it then, but, like, we don't want it ringing every day, man. God. <laughs> so, but it's still charming to sit in an Italian it's super piazza. super charming. Uh, yeah. Come on. Yeah, let's wait a second. Even for an atheist like me, it's still... Uh, <laughs> but there's, a, there's like an interesting thing, like France and in Montreal, no religious symbols in the public space. No. No, like, like you, you can't have any, you know, anything in the public space about your religion. So, in a way, this is kind of a religious symbol invading my Strong public one. space. And a very loud and noisy one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also on the podcast. Yes. No, so you, you like this... Uh, Can I have a grown-up coffee now? Grown-up coffee. Scusa, espresso? Ci porti altri... Espresso doppio. Okay. È uno normale? No, io no. Niente, un espresso e un doppio. Okay. Yeah, it's not bad to think about Italy as the well-sized uh, city. The what size? The, the life-size life city. Life-size, okay. Uh, mm, let's say, piloting place, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? And it's true that we have this recent history uh, yeah. that helps us to remember, and, but we have to link it. So your question was... Um, How do we package the, the freedom and modernity narrative uh, in order to sell this concept that we need to improve our cities and public... You know, public health and all the things we need to do in our cities. How do we? I'm just because you you said it and I say it. So how do we package that? Yeah, I think that the main point again is uh, density. So um, why it's so difficult to link the old time where we had no cars with modernity and freedom? Because 
not a lot of people can enjoy it directly. Not a lot of people can enjoy it directly because they do not live where these old city coming back in place, like in this square we are now in the center of Turin. Uh, it's just for a few. It's just for the one that can afford to live in the area. And so if you cannot link the normal life of people where they live with this new mechanism coming back on stage, then you don't have this link to contemporary life and freedom. So in a way, the only solution will be uh, believing in cities again. Uh, we did lost this belief. Uh, we thought the suburban uh, was the solution. We uh, disperse as our population a lot. Uh, so uh, if we think about uh, coming back to this uh, life side city that we used to have just in the city center where nobody lives, that will be the big mistake. Uh, that's a, that will be a big mistake and uh, uh, it will be just for Monocle or for your podcast, uh, but it won't be uh, rooted in our um, culture again. So, I don't know, it's a difficult thing, but uh, it's uh, really related to... Um, we have to, the fact that we, we have to believe again in cities, in the power of uh, being... Uh, uh, living in a dense uh, urban environment. So that's, that's to me, um, the solution. It's not just, of course, about making cycle uh, track or um, putting away cars from central squares. It has to be uh, more connected with um, a belief in cities. Okay. No, I think that, you know, cities are, I, I love cities just because they are exactly the opposite of what you would like them to be. And sometimes they are exactly in the same, uh, you know, um, flow of what you think it's good to be. And so I don't, I don't believe that we have to, you know, to package, uh, um, uh, you know, storytelling for what, what the things we aim to be, you know. They will, they will come if they are right somehow. That's the good thing of you know being all uh, condensed in a, in, a, in a tiny place and wanting to live together in, a, in an urban environment. So I think that what's good is that uh, as humans we are able to create a, a narration that we want if we really believe that it's urgent and it's needed. So, I mean, yeah, if uh, car manufacturers want to build storytelling it's fine for them if bikers want to build um, uh, storytelling it's good but there, uh, there's room for everybody and that room is actually the city itself so I think that that's what brings life to the urban environment I agree although I'm gonna say no we're in a hurry man you're saying oh if the need comes and we will the narrative will create itself and and yeah but we're in a hurry. You know, why, people are why? dying from pollution in this city and every city. I don't believe in this uh, storytelling. True. This is the, uh, lately I've changed my mind. You know why? Because uh, um, I do, yeah, it's probably true, but it's also true that we don't give a fuck. So uh, it's like Industrial Revolution. People were, were dying back there. But we didn't have any, you know. Um, G20 saying uh, oh, we have to do the Kyoto Protocol you now people were just dying and they, we always had starvation and everything uh, but we're now always more and more concerned about what we have to do and the fact is that uh, we're just preaching a lot we're not really acting so if in uh, 10 years temperature will rise up 2-3 degrees I think we'll deal with that and if Italy 50% of the landscape will be covered by sea, we'll deal with that. We want it, we'll deal with that. So what, I mean, this is also how human race go on and on. I don't really like this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, preaching, we're in danger, we're in danger. I'm not doing the Donald Trump, you know, mm. uh, style. But I'm also saying that, you know, bad things have always happened and we've always managed to find a solution, okay? And uh, I think that um, if people 
rational people around us in an urban environment, not peasants, you know, urbanites, intelligent, smart people, are not able to understand that we are in danger, we should ask why we are not able to understand we are in danger. And I discussed this with the um, you know, meteorologist, which is a very prominent figure, is always on the TV, in Italian TV, and is really scared about how things are evolving. And he told, I mean, we're failing, as meteor meteorologists, we're failing to communicate how things are dangerous. But this is, uh, of course, our problem. We can't blame people for not understanding that, you know, something is changing. So, I don't know, I have this perspective probably because I'm a communication designer and I think that we're, if we're not able to deliver a clear message, there's something wrong somewhere. Somewhere. Well, because people want, still want to fucking have their own car driving de them along, driving the car along, reaching the point from A to B, no stress, freedom at its best, modernity, uh, safety, uh, speed, that's what people want. And I, I don't know how we can change that, because apart from car, everything else is preached exactly in the same way. You have to be speedy, you have to be powerful, you have to be, I mean, uh, you have to deliver, you have to be successful, and so on. So how can we, you know, change the world mentality if in every industry we believe that you know we have to be smart speed successful blah blah but in car industry you know we have to take it slow i mean yeah, yeah slow, and slowness yeah, yeah. is okay if, if you want to relax uh, slow is good for food that's why slow food is successful slow is good for if you're on vacation but we're on I vacation. started the slow bicycle movement with 25,000 people in the Facebook group. Like, you don't have to go fast. You can actually just ride your bike slow to the shops. People yeah. embrace I, that narrative. I really like uh, your, your momentum and inertia mm -hmm. concept. That's the kind of thing that we should more, you know, make our concept. But if you know? I, yeah. it, it, it's not about being... Uh, fast or being slow it's not about opposite it's about having the right momentum you know it's a, it's about the right flow and that's why i love cities because cities are just a flow you know it, decay is a flow people building going down is a flow and then they probably collapse and then they're rising again it's but interesting it's a flow like I thought you, now it's you're never a <laughs> these or that these or that no it's just a flow uh, no, I'm thinking like momentum, like uh, like yeah, going down a steep hill on a bike is kind of fun. I'm getting, I'm 50 now, so I don't need the adrenaline kicks like I used to. But you know, a nice little sloping hill where you're you're still only going, you're just but you don't have to pedal like that long slow hill yeah, going down. That's way better. You can still you don't have to worry about dying. You can because uh, you're going so fast. You can just look at the countryside. That's maybe the kind of momentum we need. Exactly. Uh, exactly. We're going downhill, so maybe that's a bad metaphor. But you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, exactly. yeah. That's exactly. And what I, I mean. and I have a final advice to Michael, uh, even if I'm a poor Italian uh, uh, semi urbanist, but I still have an advice to him. And uh, it's about uh, um, connecting the life-sized concept, the life-sized city, which is a very powerful concept and idea, to connect it to the desire line uh, concept uh, you are now developing and not to any slow city or uh, anti-growth um, um, narrative. So, uh, the concept, in my opinion, would be much better if we connect the life-size concept to freedom, to this desire line concept. That's why, in a way, we don't know what a life-size city will be. We have no clear idea what is the what will be the ten features of a future life-size cities, and we should be happy about it. So it's going. Be happy that we don't know. We don't know. Well, yeah, okay, it's yeah. it's very important that we go very far away from the value that usually urbanists put on the table, like 
you have to be like this you have to uh, care you have to use less so it's very important that you don't go on the value side with the life size concept but you go more to the desire line concept so the future life size city is a city that we cannot draw, draw here right now and uh, that's the beauty of this that sounds cool but i'm confused because last night when we were drinking wine okay. you said you need one idea you know yeah. we always we talk about specificity yeah. like you need one idea in order the to the desire city so the life the size, desire, desire line city see this is <laughs> the desire city but maybe desire lines help form the life size city you, you, yeah. need, you need one one idea for for what okay. he's like yeah. my communication well, strategist yeah. here. Well, my, well my i i found my my one one line one idea which is actually well the, the one we're tell using tell me tell me no, tell it's, me it's that i C want to cities are mental weapons i strongly believe in that even yeah. if it sounds like a philosophical issue one day man woke up and thought that what what he was doing in his life was not enough he had to build something that were resembling his cosmologic origin you know and that was looking at the stars and say hey i want to build something like that here on earth that's how cities were born this is so powerful that if we still believe in that i mean how many cool things can grow out of that this is but if you say say that today you know it's not really easy i mean maybe it's easy here in italy or in maybe uh, in copenhagen uh, where you see weird and cool stuff it's really really hard to do it in you know south america cities and uh, american cities and sprawl you know you go there and say cities are mental weapons people will say fuck you man what the fuck are you ta talking about so but let's go back to that and think that Imagination is the first tool to build cities. And so we go back to imagination to think what's next. The future of the cities it's on people's desires. A life-size city is not in the minds of few planners, few aristocrats or Socrates or whatever, but it's in people's desire and we have to develop tools, attitudes, culture, storytelling everything to make this happen to make the city of the future the life size city of the future closer and closer to people's needs okay so i talk about the age of urbanism you say cities are mental weapons you have urban century uh, i mean what what is what is what is the what what are all those things i mean how do we you know also narrative wise how do we define this i mean we all live in cities we all focus on cities we work in cities uh it's what we do when we wake up in the morning that's all we think about you know uh but how do we how, you know, how do we package this and 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 where do we go from this because there's a lot of people talking about urbanism and, yeah. and and cities and we know that cities are the new powerhouses and you know the countryside doesn't matter anymore in in the global narrative it's all cities and the c40 and everything like that but uh you know are we just sort of arrogant city people thinking that we're cooler than everybody else or is this really the 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 urban century the age of urbanism and all so, that yeah no and uh, yeah and that's the question uh, exactly and uh, that's why i asked it right? yeah, yeah no that's the question that's the question and uh, uh, we will fail as uh, elite uh, as an elite that is constantly talking about things like cities if we won't connect this uh, uh, future path that we see with people desire so that's mm -hmm. that's the that's the thing no more values no more prescriptions no more um, abstract rules it's all about reversing the game putting desire and anxieties and uh, random thoughts at the center of planning so well that's mm -hmm. to me the solution no, I, I, I mean, again, imagination, what does it mean? For me, it means that, well, also that, uh, yes, somehow we are cooler than others, but why? Not just because we are, it's us, but we're, we're trying to, you know, to, to narrate in a, in a better way, which is a very, you know, valuable thing. It's not a boring, complaining, you know, 
a chat. It's a, something that ignites people to do something or to think more actively, which is already very, very good. First and secondly, because we are creating images, and images are powerful. So I think that not just talking about cities, but trying to design something and in and put it in images, like the sketch you show from of the Tour Eiffel, you know, from the the, the crossroads from the Tour Eiffel. Just a simple sketch done by your intern can change the perspective. So if we are able to bring more and more people to uh, to go from one idea or one complaint to a simple sketch, then the scale of this urban interest will definitely change, dramatically change. But you also advance the conversation. Hey, let's do this. And the, No, I don't want to do that. What are you telling? No, I don't want to do that. Explain it to me. No, I don't understand that, so therefore I don't want it. You know, Søren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, said mm. everybody wants progress, but nobody wants change, right? Exactly, and so, exactly, but exactly. then you're saying, yeah, we have to stop talking. We have to start showing, yeah, exactly. whether it's an, show, an illustration show. or a pilot project or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And the pilot projects is, 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 is it's a super cool thing. You know, you just as you said, you know, we do that. We test. We test it. It came out so many times in these days at the conferences. You have to test things and uh, uh, and also show show people how it could become. And that's something that if you also sh not just show that to people, but uh, somehow try to tell them how to do that for themselves. And maybe, you know, that could also mean that we could start to do it at schools. My son, 13 year old yesterday, uh, on Friday came back to school and because, he, you know, he know about the festival, he passed out a sheet of paper in his classroom asking, what is the city of your dream? And he collected 20 response. So, so basically all the kids answered saying what, what is the city that they wanted. And the cool thing about it is that all of them not just replied, but they sketched something. Mm. So that means that, that when you're a kid, you still have very much connected what you want to have in words what, with what we, we, you want to have with images. So I think we should go back to that. Mm -hmm. Relate concepts with the images. Be able to show people more images. You know, far-fetching things, very simple things, from benches to, you know, skyscrapers or a super cool new way of uh, transporting people. But creating images is the way forward to, to build the better cities together. That's my idea. And, uh, and of course, that's how, that's why I think we're so... Uh, in you know, in power to do this because we are communicators, we are designers, we are planners, we are uh, thinkers, we are people who deal with these loads of information and images daily. So we have the, the the responsibility to you know to take care of this and to bring it to people that have less capacity of absorbing this every day. Another lesson I learned from this festival, being together, that this. Um, question that Michael asked before it's embedded in exactly what we are doing working together as urban practitioners storytellers etc because the opposite of what we need is solo player gurus that's not the way uh, we can link the life size city concept with the design line we have to connect those voices together. We have to create a sort of momentum, a sort of collective actions toward this. It's not the time of Floridas and uh, young girls and uh, um, gurus like. That's not the way. People doesn't feel involved in those uh, solists. Yeah. So we need to like like with the desire lines, the people without even us explaining to them exactly. what they're doing, exactly. they're just going to go. I have to go there, and they will form the desire lines, and we will build around their. I mean, yeah, we're going to actively uh, involve them in the planning process, hopefully, um, even if they don't know about it. You exactly. Know, like, not I with this meeting that uh, young girl uh, yeah. touched us to do. Not with uh, prevent preemptive. Uh, um, analysis that then uh, creates books and rules. No, 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 no. In a very different and peculiar way. There's a 
empty space uh, in front of us to fill with mm. this new uh, way of doing things. So we have to fill it. Together. Together. No solo player. No solo player. Never, <laughs> never, never. No Ronaldo. We More need a whole festival. team, right? No yeah. <laughs> I hate Ronaldo. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, cool. It was very cool. good. Yeah. Rebooting cities. Detroit is just out of the starting blocks. They've regrouped, took a deep breath, and they're moving. Much of the effort is focused on the 7.2, the downtown area, and doesn't benefit the vast majority of the population. But they're moving, figuring themselves out, curating the storytelling in order to understand their past, present, and future is original and necessary. Medellin, you urbanist darling. Man, all that hard work and now, because of politics, you've stagnated. I think the work that has been done is, luckily, irreversible. It's past the tipping point. But damn, I wish you would continue rocking it. We need you to do it. To once again lead the way with your brash thinking, your passionate approach. I hope you get back on track. Italy? Yeah, Italy has provided us with so much inspiration for urban life through centuries. Now they've made the same mistakes as the rest of us. But it is my hope that the short distance between memories of the past and the current situation will help the cities expedite their journeys back to the future. Again, we need leadership. Doesn't look like much is coming out of Italy regarding urbanism, but let's hope that that will change. That wraps up another episode of the Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Thanks for listening. And you know, remember, it's your city. Take it back. <laughs> <laughs>